Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, uh, this is a very Neapolitan or Sicilian of me to use uh, the knife here. But, <laughs> but uh, our president couldn't make it tonight. Uh, Eric Abraham uh, gave his uh, regrets. He had, uh, he's on the awards judging panel for the Hudson Valley Builders Awards Night. And of course, as luck would have it, that was tonight and he could not get out of it, so he did extend his regrets, especially having such a, a great program and a great speaker here tonight. Um, my name is Albert Annunziata, Executive Director, and uh, on behalf of Jeff Hanley, my colleague, and our many uh, trustees and directors in the audience, thank you so much for coming, uh, coming out tonight for our final general membership meeting of the year. We have a little bit of business before we get to our, our speaker tonight. Uh, a couple of things. One. Um, for all you non-techies out there, we, uh, we took the liberty of, of handing out our 2015 uh, pocket calendar and, and diary book. So hopefully you can use that. And if any of you are too smart to use it and are solely uh, interested in the electronic calendars, uh, we can use them back. So, uh, you know, so if you don't want them, we'll take them back from you. Uh, secondly, we're having our last event of the year, our uh, holiday party on Friday, December 5th at, um, at Arrowwood. So you'll see at your, uh, at your uh, table there uh, flyers for both the holiday party and uh, if any of you would like to be a sponsor, uh, the sponsorship form is attached. We would love to have you uh, uh, come in as both an attendee and a sponsor. We can always use the support. Uh, it should prove to be a very nice evening. Many of you are, are trustees and directors and already answered uh, the clarion call of uh, Jeff Hanley's email with your generosity. If there are any trustees and directors out there who haven't uh, jumped at the chance to be a sponsor, uh, don't let your uh, colleagues get the better of you. Uh, we would like you to also be a sponsor uh, uh, for that evening. So uh, thank you for your support. For those of you who have already sent in your uh, RSVPs, thank you so much. Finally, a little bit of order of business. The uh, November meeting is the meeting where we, uh, we finalize uh, uh, nominations for the directors of the various component boards. And uh, Jeff Hanley and I will uh, take care of that, and we'll get through with this in about five minutes. So uh, the following are the Builders Institute BRI 2015 nominees for officers, board, board uh, positions uh, uh, for the uh, various advisory councils. For the Apartment Owners Advisory Council, Chairman is Carmelo Milio, Vice Chairs Anna, Alana Schifatelli and Jerry Houlihan. Uh, and the, on the board, Jeff Burdick, Alessandra Chansey, Maxine Chuck, Jean Conroy, Lisa DeRosa, Wilma Harris, Elith Larson, Giselle Manke, Brian McCarthy, Ken Nilsson, Howard Ravikoff, and Silvio Solari. And now Jeff will do the co-op and condominium advisory council. CCAC, Chair Diana Viril, Vice Chairs Jane Curtis Angelo Ponzi, Board members, Clementine Carbo, Carol Carney, Pick Conover, Carl DeMeo, Dory Engley, Jeff Foster, Kathleen Jensen Graham, Pat Kinsey, Michelle Lavard, Sandra Laske, Cesar Manfredi, Joe McCarthy, Herb Rose, Jay Tagger. Thank you, Jeff. Advisory Council of Managing Agents, Chairman David Amster, Vice Chairs John Benito and Jeff Stillman. On the board, Jennifer Champion. Uh, Campion, Robert Ferrara, Bram Feierstein, John Holzinger, Catherine Jennings, Ed Lombardi, Bob Lupica, and Brian Scally. <coughs> Home Builders Advisory Council, Chair Bob Bossy, Vice Chairs Gus Boniello, Eric Lashens, Board Members Eric Abraham, Bill Balter, Joe Barada, <coughs> Doug Esposito, Susan Fosnock, and Saul I. Gluckman. Okay, and the following remaining two are, um, I'll, I'll just do it together just because they're on sure. the short side. Remodelers Advisory Council, Chairman Eric Messer, Vice Chairs Joe Pizzamenti and Sandy Levine. On the board, Linda Blair, Matthew Lubrano, Hillary Shepard. Commercial Builders Advisory Council, Chair Lee Lasberg, Vice Chairs Brett LaRoque and Vince Vitarelli. On the board, Tim Allen, Mike Baldotti, Tom DeCaro, Ed Lashen, Steve McCulloch, <coughs> Matt Parrish, Sam Rivellini, and Robert Weinberg. So those, are, according to the bylaws, those are the nominees for the various boards that are going into 2015. I call on, uh, what do I want to listen to my JFK? I call on our uh, senior uh, counsel here to uh, make a following motion. Uh, Secretary, I, 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 vote, I vote for 
and Steve to be at the AOAC. Uh, and Steve, uh, Steve should be on the AOAC. And if not, we can, we can, the nominations are, uh, the nominations are still open, so we'll have Steve Gifford. Very good. Mr. Nelson, thank you. Uh, any other uh, nominees? Second his nomination. I do. Okay. All right, so uh, based on the motion of, uh, of our council emeritus, uh, our secretary, Susan Fastak, is not here tonight, so we will do it by acclamation. Uh, properly uh, annotated with Steve Gifford uh, added to the AOAC. Uh, all in favor, aye? Aye. I don't want you to sound so enthusiastic now. I mean, yeah. I mean we're, we're, just, we're just starting the evening. You know, I want, I want, I've got to whip you into a small frenzy for our speaker, you know, so I want you to be a little pepped up here. Uh, all those uh, opposed? All right. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you very much. And we're going into 2015 with, with a, a, a few new faces, with new blood, as well as a lot of experienced people. Thank you very much for your interest in 2014. And God willing, may 2015 be a better year. Um, we've had the pleasure of uh, having Richard Ravitch speak with us, uh, I think, two or three times over the past decade. Uh, we've been very blessed to have uh, him come to speak of us, uh, to us. He's been very gracious with his time. And, uh, and you know, even though, you know, like everybody knows about him, uh, even I had to kind of go on to Wikipedia and just kind of refresh myself on, uh, on his life and accomplishments. And, uh, you know, just going back to the JFK uh, theme again, uh, th they once asked JFK at one of his uh, uh, press conferences, I think 62 press conferences to be precise, uh, to describe, uh, to find excellence. And uh, I don't have it memorized, but it was something along the lines of, I'm not going to do JFK, but, but you, can, you, can, you can almost hear him say this, that, you know, excellence was the, uh, the consistent pursuit of the highest and best use of, of one's talents and abilities, not only for one's own personal fulfillment, but also for the greater public good. And, uh, and I said, you know, that's Richard Ravage. I mean, that, that's, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. And I could go through the whole, you know, uh, biography and, and accomplishments, but the thing is, is that no matter what he has been involved with uh, over the years, uh, from the 1960s with his, with, with his family's construction business and, and being uh, appointed by President Lyndon Johnson to uh, the U.S. Commission on, on Urban Problems, um, he focused on you know, affordable and middle-income housing, on housing issues, and really very early on demonstrated, I guess one, one could call the social conscious conscience and consciousness of the building industry when it came to housing and affordable housing and, and urban development issues. And in all of these uh, many, many appointments and, and positions, many of, many of which he, he served either without pay or, you know, or the, or the, uh, the uh, token one dollar a year uh, compensation, uh, not only did he demonstrate badly needed policy leadership in, in these positions, but he was often responsible for salvaging and reforming the finances of these organizations uh, and again, uh, doing it uh, as, as a public service. Uh, so, uh, you know, many of you might remember more recent history when he was uh, appointed uh, lieutenant governor after a, a, a very um, uh, acrimonious political stalemate in Albany once uh, uh, Governor Spitzer resigned and, and uh, then Lieutenant Governor Patterson was thrust into the governor's position. It was a time of upheaval and whatever. And, uh, and uh, when Governor Patterson uh, appointed uh, Richard Ravitch as Lieutenant Governor uh, to, uh, to use an old Neapolitan phrase, uh, it created a hazarai in Albany in terms of the, um, the uh, you know, then Attorney General uh, Andrew Cuomo was contesting the validity and the Republicans were fighting it and, uh, you know, every time Dick and Harry was against it. Uh, but finally, uh, both Mr. Patterson and Mr. Ravitch prevailed in the, US court, uh, the State Court of Appeals in saying that, indeed, under the circumstances and within the powers of the governor, uh, the appointment was valid. So he has made history in so many different ways and has shown his dedication and excellence in so many different ways. So in addition to uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, remark about excellence, uh, 
the title of his most recent book uh, in 2014 uh, also says a lot about the man. So much to do, a full life of business, politics, and confronting fiscal crises, and I would also add a life, a continuing life uh, in the pursuit of excellence. So without further ado, I'm going to call up Richard Ravage to share with us some of his comments and observations. And, uh, Thank you. That was an embarrassing introduction. <clears throat> it reminded me of the, the one time I ran for office and one of my kids worked in my campaign. There weren't a hell of a lot of other people who did, but uh, and he introduced me at a church in Queens. Uh, and somebody gave him my curriculum vitae, and he looked at all of the things I'd been involved in, and he said, <clears throat> "All I can say is he was a wonderful father, and he can't hold one job for too long." <laughs> um, um, I, I don't keep accepting these gracious invitations to come here uh, just because of uh, Al's wonderful introductions, because of all the things that I've done, the thing that I, I think is the most meaning for me was being a builder. Uh, and I miss that world. Um, it was complex, fraught with risks, uh, but it was exciting. Uh, my grandfather was an ironmonger, and I told our 13 grandchildren, I've showed them all a, a sidewalk grading my grandfather made in, in, two in 1903. Um, and I think that's probably uh, the memento that I care about the most in my life. Um, <clears throat> and I think changing the face of the earth is still the most exciting business in the world. So for those of you who are in that business today, uh, God bless you and uh, there's a part of me who wishes I hadn't shifted gears and got into public life because a lot of things have happened since I left the building business in the 70s. But that's not what I'm here about. So I, I want to try to tell you <clears throat> uh, a couple of things that I think you might find interesting. When I was Lieutenant Governor, um, I had nothing to do. It, the job has no function whatsoever. Has no function whatsoever. It, it was, I, I've had a lot of jobs in my life. I never had an office as glorious as this. Wood paneled, carvings, painted ceilings. Uh, right off the floor of the state senate. It was without a doubt a spectacular office and there was absolutely no portfolio whatsoever. And <clears throat> I decided that I had to do something useful. Um, and I decided to delve into the question of New York State's finances. And I learned that there was a lot of gimmickry in balancing the budget in New York State over the years. And the more I learned, the more I got upset. Because I began to think of all the things that I enjoyed that the state paid for in cash, but that my 13 grandchildren are ultimately going to bear the cost of. And I want to give you a few of the a few illustrations of what I learned. I learned that they passed a law that permitted the state to make contributions to the state pension fund in the form of promissory notes. So there's now four billion dollars in the state pension fund that consists of promissory notes from the state to with a 3.5% coupon where they use a 7.5% discount rate to measure the adequacy of the pension funding. I learned and should have remembered that the state securitized its tobacco revenues back in the 90s 
to pay for increased Medicaid benefits, and every subsequent year had to increase the spending in order to repeat those expenditures. Uh, that the state was taking money out of the state insurance fund to cover operating expenses, that it was borrowing to uh, fill operating deficits, not for capital investments in the future. And because I had the wonderful, exciting privilege of being involved in New York City's near bankruptcy in 1975, that I have told people for the last 40 years that the most significant thing that we did in 1975 was to pass a law that required the city of New York to budget in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Now, for all of you who are out of the commercial world, uh, this doesn't sound so remarkable because you don't borrow to pay for dinner tomorrow night. You may borrow to buy a home. Uh, you may borrow to invest in your business expecting a return. But you don't borrow to cover, as I said, tomorrow night's dinner or tomorrow's rent. But New York State's been doing that for a long time. And that's what we prohibited New York City from ever doing again. And New York City has never had a fiscal crisis since then, and it never will. But New York State has balanced its budget because it's on a cash budgeting basis, not on an accrual basis, not in the way that GAP would require. Uh, and it's not in the long term a sustainable uh, process because there are not an unlimited number of assets to sell. New York State, for example, sold Attica Prison to a state authority, borrowed the money to pay for the prison, treated the sales price as a revenue to balance the budget in the year uh, they s sold it. And we have since paid $400 million of interest on the debt that was incurred to provide $200 million 20 years ago uh, to balance the budget in that year. I could go on and on with illustrations. Suffolk County, not exactly a poor county, not as rich as Westchester, of course, but um, Suffolk County uh, ran into fiscal problems. They sold their county office building and used the proceeds to balance this year's budget. Um, so I got fascinated. I said, this can't, I mean, New Yorkers can't be different from other people. And I began to research it. And to make a long story short, that's how I have spent the better part of these last few years, is trying to understand what the hell is happening in my country. And I have to tell you that what New York did is mild compared to what's going on in other places in this country. States and cities have borrowed in billions upon billions of dollars to balance operating budgets. They've sold assets. Just tell you one anecdote to illustrate it. I had occasion uh, a year and a half ago to meet with the mayor of Chicago, who had just become mayor, Rahm Emanuel. Very sophisticated politician. He had been a big shot in the House of Representatives and very smart guy. And I walked into his office and he said to me, you know what that guy Dick Daly did, who was his predecessor? He said he hocked 75 years of parking revenue. The city of Chicago used the proceeds to balance his last budget before he left office and has left Chicago with no parking revenues. Well, enough of the illustrations. This is happening all over the country. And at the same time, one of the other things that are happening is that retirement expenditures are going up a lot faster than state and local tax revenues. We made a lot of promises in this society, made in good faith, with good intention 
that we cannot afford to pay at today's level of revenues. We made promises that result in pension funds, public pension funds, around the country being underfunded by trillions of dollars, unable to meet their ultimate obligations, um, uh, particularly given what they can earn, those assets can earn in today's market. Um, second, we made promises to provide health care to our public employees. Perfectly appropriate commitment to hopefully get talented people to devote their life to public service. But I would respectfully suggest that we are, uh, at this point, the unfunded uh, health care liabilities of the cities and states of the United States, about a trillion and a half dollars, and it's growing. Um, as a result of all of these pressures, this is why states and cities are selling assets and borrowing money to have enough cash to meet today's expenditures. To put it bluntly, we are disinvesting in our future in order to keep the promises that we, in good faith, made in the past. And this is a very difficult, troublesome problem that is not being confronted honestly by anybody in politics today. Because the seduction, the, the temptation for every politician to kick the can down the road to get through the next election has become overwhelming. And that is equally true whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. Let me try to, to tell you about New York State a little more specifically. Um, as I said, historically, they've done a lot of things and spent a lot of money, which our kids, your kids, my grandchildren are going to pay for. Um, and it's very hard to reverse that overnight. It has not been reversed. And I understand very well people don't like to pay more taxes. Uh, and I understand that paying taxes uh, or the issue of taxes becomes a paramount issue in, in people who run for political office. But let's look for a second and make some judgments. New York State has lost population fairly steadily. I understand Westchester's probably done better than any other part of this state. But upstate, our cities are a mess. They don't have the ability to invest adequately in their water systems, in their sewer systems. They've lost population. They are mandated by state law with respect to the, their pension obligations. They are mandated by collective bargaining agreements that they can't get out of because of the Triborough Amendment to make health care payments. And they are mandated uh, by uh, the necessity of, of urban life to have an adequate police force and, and fire department. And they have uh, no uh, flexibility with respect to their ability to borrow, to invest in, in infrastructure. Um, and that, I think, bothers me more than anything else, because one, I, as I said, was a builder, and two, uh, my most rewarding and important public service task was to chair the MTA. I created Metro North, uh, rebuilt, spent $14 billion starting the rebuilding of the subway system. How did I do that? We got revenues. I raised the fare five times. I raised the tolls. I was not popular. As a matter of fact, there were two attempts on my life when I was chairman of the MTA. Uh, uh, but I got the legislature to enact a series of taxes, uh, th the revenue of which, from which, uh, provided the ability to borrow uh, close to $20 billion to start the rebuilding of these various transportation systems. 
Now, it's hard to think back to the early 80s, um, <clears throat> but the interesting part of that was that uh, the business community, the leadership of the business community supported that because they recognized that without a viable public transportation system in this region, that we would <coughs> not have any economic growth. <clears throat> as late as 2009, where it, I had the honor of chairing a commission uh, to recommend to the state what to do with the fact that the MTA was once again going broke, and I recommended a payroll tax. Most of you probably pay three basis points uh, on the payroll mobility tax. It produces a billion and a half, maybe a billion six this year of revenue for the MTA, which in fact services close to $20 billion uh, of debt that was invested in maintaining a state of good repair and hopefully ultimately um, uh, increasing the capacity of the MTA. For example, we desperately need uh, a Metro North uh, uh, access to Penn Station. Uh, we, we desperately need to uh, expand uh, the service uh, from um, Long Island. We need another main line. There are six million people riding the subways every day in New York City today. There were three and a half when I left as, as chairman in 1984. Uh, and our signal system in our subways, which limits the number of trains that can carry people every day, was, was, uh, is the same as it was in 1903. Now there's a technology today that would permit far more input, far more uh, train traffic. It would be able to move a lot more people. It requires money. And um, I, I, I use that for illustrative purposes, but we're at a very, very uh, interesting juncture in our history now. And I, I guess in a sense, uh, why I was so delighted to get Al's invitation and join you tonight. Because I really believe that economic growth, which is what we're all ultimately dependent on for the values of the assets that we own or the things we want to build or the things we want to create or the, the, the things we want to lend money to. Uh, uh, I believe that's far more dependent on the public infrastructure than it is on whether the tax rate is a couple of basis points, more or less, one way or the other. And I don't know why it has become so fashionable to focus uh, on that question, uh, above all other questions. It's the, questions that, the question that has dominated politics in New York State. And, and um, I'm going to sort of conclude by, by using two very current illustrations, which I think are, are and should be a real concern to those of you who are responsible for the commercial life of, uh, of Westchester and, and presumably live here. One, the Tappan Zee Bridge. When I was Lieutenant Governor, the last thing I did was to write a report which I made public, it didn't get a hell of a lot of attention, pointing out, amongst other things, that, that the uh, Tabatsey Bridge was in a serious state of disrepair, almost to the point where, when I went to Albany for my dysfunctional job, uh, I often wondered about whether I should cross the Tabatsey or go the other way. Uh, <laughs> Because actually the piles that supported each end of the Tappan Zee Bridge are now at about a 45 degree angle, and that's a little scary. And the engineers at the Department of Transportation took me on a boat underneath to look at the Tappan Zee. And clearly, it had to be rebuilt or we needed a new bridge. And there was a great plan to, to not only build the new Tappan Zee Bridge, but to uh, have a mass transit option as well, because the need for being able to move people uh, through public vehicles, reduce 
the dependency on auto be built to, to reduce uh, uh, the pollution uh, that causes global warming through an excess of, um, uh, of automobile traffic. It was a great plan. And the question was how much the tolls would be to support or building a new bridge. Um, well, they started a construction. I, I'm pleased to say the governor recognized the importance of having the bridge. But he was asked recently uh, what the tolls were going to be, and he said he didn't know because he didn't know how many people would use it or how many or what it would cost. Well, another way of saying if you're going to finance the capital cost of the new Tappan Zee Bridge, the tolls would be very, very high. And what would that would do to the economy of the region is a legitimate question. But nobody has ever talked about what those tolls should be, and there's no public discourse on that subject. And that's exactly what we should be talking about, because I don't have to tell you how important it is to have a viable Hudson Crossing. Uh, at that point. Let me give you another illustration. The MTA has a $32 billion capital plan, uh, and they, by their own admission, are $17 billion short of what they, of the capital they have access to to maintain a state of good repair in, in, in this region. That includes Metro North. Uh, and I think if I remember correctly, there's over four billion of their total $32 billion plan is going to be spent on, on Metro North. Um, no response. Nobody in politics has been willing to stand up and say, I mean, neither party, stand up and say, hey, you know, we can raise the fares or the tolls to a certain limit. But we need revenue to support the capital investment we have to have to maintain, let alone enhance, the economic viability of the region and the state and the city that we live in. So uh, I hope it's not inappropriate to conclude my comments by uh, making a plea that you look into this issue. Uh, and. The numbers are accessible to you, uh, and ask yourself the question, and begin to address the people in politics, uh, and ask them to stop pandering to the most selfish part that, of all of us, and recognize that we have a, a real commitment, not only to keep the promises that we made in the past, but to invest in the future. And the pennies that are involved in trying to provide the means of it, continuing that investment are so small in comparison to the burden that we're imposing if we don't make that investment. Um, and I think that issue has to go way beyond polit the normal partisanship uh, that seems to preoccupy politics in this country today. Uh, and and um, all of us in this room, I suspect, don't have to worry about paying for our groceries the next day. But we've got to think a hell of a lot more how our children, in my case, 13 grandchildren, are going to be able to pay for all the benefits that I've enjoyed in my 81 years. And um, with that note, I, I, again, thank you for inviting me, and I hope to... <laughs> It's uh, 819. It's 819. We have time for a few questions. I've already told Mr. Nelson he's to have one question. No more, because there are others in this room who would like to ask a question. But since he was the first one, he was paying attention. I was watching him over there. But he was paying absolute attention to Mr. Ravage, so, and he raised his hand first. So, Mr. Nelson, you have the honor of the first question. Okay. Uh, please get up so we can all hear your question. All right. Uh, thank you for the... For for illuminating, uh, but I wonder if is is the fundamental problem is that we have been expecting more and more 
from government and are less and less willing to pay for it. In other words, o over time, and this is not only in New York State, but throughout the country and, and the federal government. Uh, and, and as a result, we have a national deficit, but really what you've said is that probably the deficit of local government, states and cities and towns, is probably greater than the federal government. You don't hear about By far. The, the, yeah. the, the deficit. But isn't it this fundamental issue is that we've asked the government to do more, but we're not willing to pay for it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> is, is, it, is it more than just... I think that I think that's true, and and um, you know I have to tell you a marvelous story. In 1979, Jimmy Carter, President Carter, proposed a three cent increase in the national gas tax to fund the Highway Trust Fund, which was originally the source of money for building the interstate highway system, and subsequently became the source of capital for a whole national highway system and other things. And it never got out of the Congress. It never got out of committee. And nothing happened. 1981, Pro President Reagan proposed a five cent increase in the gas tax, one penny of which was to go to mass transit. And it went through the Congress like a knife through butter. And because I was chairman of the MTA at the time, I was invited to the bill signing at the White House. And the first question President Reagan was asked was, Mr. President, how could you support a nickel increase on the gas tax when you got elected on a platform of no new taxes? And Reagan looked at the reporter and he put his finger out and he said, it's not a tax, it's a user charge. <laughs> and the next day, the Wall Street Journal story was a nickel user charge on gasoline. And that was the largest infusion of federal money into the public infrastructure ever. There has not been one penny of increase in the gas tax since then. I think that tells the story better than anything. Uh, any other questions? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Jim, you don't have to stand up. Just, just uh, articulate. Uh, Richard, can you propose, or, or do you have ideas? I and mean, you have a lot of ideas, but um, when you talk about uh, defined benefit costs for uh, retirees in in the public sector, I don't. I, I work in the private sector. I don't have defined benefit costs. I don't have a defined benefit pension plan. And my health insurance, I will be paying for in retirement. How do we replace that? Because that, that's something. Well, that that's that's a that's a very important question, and uh, let me put it to you this way: It's not just the public pension funds that are inadequately funded uh, to cover their obligations. The private defined though there are still a lot of defined benefit plans in the private sector, and under the ERISA statute. Those are presumptively guaranteed by the Pension Benefit Guarantee Board. Yet, actually, they have published uh, uh, documents showing that the contingent liability get, uh, that they have is also well over a billion, a trillion dollars. They have no way of funding that. So, the, the, the answer is that the whole defined benefit system that we have, publicly and privately, is in jeopardy. And some people say, well, you have to change it all to a uh, uh, defined contribution system. Uh, for 1K plans. The problem with that is the average 401K plan in the United States today is $37,000. And to put it crudely, who the hell could live off the income of thirty-seven thousand dollars? So uh, my answer is, this is in many ways the toughest problem we have. Um, perhaps even greater than infrastructure. I'm an infrastructure guy because, as I said, my grandfather was an ironmonger. Uh, 
But that's the greatest problem. We have to design a, a retirement system uh, uh, that, that works in a society like ours. And I, I think people are just beginning to recognize that in both the pi private and public sectors. But I don't have a simple answer for it. Yes, just stand up and with your question. Hi, uh, Valerie Mazars. I follow this closely. The um, unfunded mandates that are out there makes Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme look like a walk in the park yep. for what is coming down the pike quite seriously. Um, so my encouragement on the individual level is that people need to prepare for themselves, not look to the government for that. I, as a taxpayer, would be more than happy to uh, pay more taxes. But what I need to know from my government that they're running as lean and mean as they possibly can. I'll sacrifice more if I know they're doing as lean as mean as they can. And as a citizenry, what do you, what suggestions do we have as to whom, who do we speak to, who do we you know, impress upon, and, or perhaps as a coalition, what do we do? Well, first of all, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and the only answer to the problem is we got to we got to get better people to run for office. I mean this very sincerely. Uh, money has become corruptive in politics now, and whether the money comes from unions or whether the money comes from banks, uh, the, the percentage of money in politics that is motivated by wanting government to produce end results has, in my view at least, reached a point of absurdity. And it's very difficult for a young person who may want to go into politics and, and public service uh, to, <clears throat> to raise money to be able to run without going to somebody who has a very specific self-interest in what that individual would do if they got into public life. So I think public campaign financing is a legitimate issue that we have to address. And second of all, our, our culture, uh, politics has become to so many people a bad word, and I understand the reason for it. I mean, what's going on in Washington is a disgrace, in my view. Uh, and it gives politics a bad name. Uh, and <clears throat> But unless we're all willing to participate in politics. You know, I, I, I begin my book with a quote from Plato, which says, if you're not prepared to engage in politics, you deserve to be governed by inferior people. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's really the answer. And it's within our capability, individually and collectively, to get better people uh, to go into politics uh, and to get elected. And it doesn't really matter in the final analysis whether they're Republicans or Democrats. Um, because, you know, I just started reading last night the, the biography of Nelson Rockefeller. And whereas he had difficulty distinguishing between borrowed money and appropriated money, he nonetheless was a visionary. And he built a lot of housing for middle class people. He built the state university, did a lot of things. He was a Republican. Uh, so um, I don't know what else to say except uh, you can change things. Everybody in this room could change a hell of a lot more than I think you think you could. Uh, Jean DeResta. Mr. Robinson, I'm listening and enjoying your presentation. I'm a professor at NYU, and I can speak from comments students make. There's a, an absence of trust in the government. Yep. And this is most apparent as a result of the expose of the NCA, the uh, CIA, all of that. There's a complete mistrust. Not only that, students, faculty at prestigious universities see that the United States is being run by people with money. In order to make it into public office, you have to have money. There is no venue, no mechanism by which an individual who's competent, who's capable, can run for office. It's not possible. 
So how do we realize the things that you're saying? Well, I'll tell you something. There, there has recently been an effort led by former Senator Bill Bradley and a group of distinguished Republicans uh, to consolidate all the efforts around the country to advocate uh, campaign finance reform. Uh, will it work tomorrow? No. Will it work eventually? Yes. And that's the only answer in my view, because you're absolutely right. Money has, has corrupted our politics because you can't run unless you have money and you're not going to get money from any place. Enough money today other than from people who have a self-interest in what you do when you're elected. Um, I think some of the cynicism that young people express is aided and abetted by the media. Um, the media today tends to treat politics as a sort of dirty thing uh, and not appreciate that politics is the only way you change things in a democracy. So that is has been a cultural liability. Um, but I don't have a simple answer to the question. Uh, and I'm very, I, I, I'm very concerned with this. When my grandson, 18-year-old grandson, said to me, he said, a friend of mine, Grandpa, said you were a politician. That can't be true, is it? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I said, well, I, you know, by some people's standards, I'm an absolutely crappy politician, but I've certainly been involved in politics. Um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, you, 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 your, your tone is, is decidedly, I mean, sobering, but positive. And I know you, you were at the University of Albany uh, Law School uh, yesterday on, on the whole Detroit uh, uh, situation bankruptcy, so kind of a further underscoring your, your talk about the condition around conditions around the country. Uh, just to kind Can of I say one word yeah, about that, yes, absolutely. Because several people ask me, and I, I it's very complicated, but essentially, for 50 years, Detroit, every statistic in Detroit, every economic and demographic statistic, and the physical infrastructure of that city went downhill without exception from year to year and nobody did a damn thing about it to the point where they had accumulated 18 billion dollars of debt and one mayor in the Huskow for 25 years uh, debt that was fraudulently marketed that was rated by the rating agencies nonetheless uh, uh, Union contracts that bore no relationship to what the city could properly uh, afford. And uh, finally, uh, there was no alternative. They went into bankruptcy. And they're now out of bankruptcy. That doesn't mean that the city's going to turn around. It took a massive effort on the part of uh, a large number of, of very distinguished judges, uh, contributions by individuals and private foundations. Uh, um, there were 20,000 former employees of the city who were not eligible for Social Security and whose pension fund had been frittered away. Um, immense problems have been solved. Now, that's the most egregious example in the country. Uh, but it tells you what can happen uh, and there were Democrats and Republican governors of Michigan. It was not a uh, it was not a right wing state or a left wing state. It's it's kind of been in the middle politically. Uh, but today, the, the population of Detroit is only 10 percent of the population of the whole state. It doesn't drive the politics of of Michigan. When the governor was looking for an appropriation of only 200 million dollars to help avoid or help get Detroit out of bankruptcy. And forgive me uh, for sounding too partisan, but the Koch brothers campaigned vigorously against that appropriation, which I found incredible. Uh, uh, and so this tells you how bad things can, can get if people don't understand 
and, and can't measure all the consequences of what they do and not just the consequences they intend. I'm sorry to no, add no, that No, 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 one, one quick question. Uh, uh, probably uh, many of us saw the uh, specials on PBS, the Ken, latest Ken Burns special on, on Theodore Roosevelt and FDR. Yeah. And I guess from 1901 when Teddy was president to 1932, 36, the first term of FDR, uh, kind of comparable to the period of time you said uh, from Ronald Reagan when that last uh, highway tax went through to the president's about the same period of time. I look at I look at those specials and I say, oh my God, have we? How do we recover from even just this century alone, from 14, 15, 16 years of what we've got versus what might have been had there been another Teddy Roosevelt or an FDR or whoever or Reagan? Uh, you know, take your pick. So. Is the, I know you're trying to leave it on an optimistic note, and my wife is the optimist in the family. I'm the pessimist. Is the hole too big? Or, or is there you know, still a chance to... Uh, I, I think about this a lot, and I'm going to answer in a very corny way, and then I'm going to sit down. Okay. Uh, and, and the answer is, we overcame a depression in the 1930s that was unbelievably devastating in terms of the condition of our country. We then won a world war. We then ended 200 years of racial segregation in this country. We then beat the Soviet Union in a, in a cold war. This problem is small potatoes compared to what we did in the past. And that's why, despite everything I said, I'm still an optimist. And politics will turn. I think the younger generation uh, is not going to be as irresponsible as our generation has been. And I, I really do. And I think they, they're going to insist that things get done uh, to make sure they have a future and that they're not going to be uh, burdened only with the costs of paying for our benefits. Well, on that note, please, thank you.